Day four, beware of open and go. The resort on a beach of all curricula is the open and go variety. You receive the UPS box in the mail, crack the spine of the new workbook or text, and immediately know what to do right now with your kids without any preparation, reading of instructions, or adoption of a particular philosophy. This magical product teaches the tough subject you have avoided without taxing you. Plus, your kids like it. What a bargain. So do these products work for writing? More specifically, does Brave Writer have a product like this? Please, mother may I? Writing is unlike content-oriented subject matter. You aren't exposing your children to a list of facts or details and asking them to memorize or consume them. Writing isn't a set of formulae to be introduced and practiced. Writing isn't the coordination of handwriting, punctuation, spelling, and grammar that can be learned in workbook formats. Writing is more than any of these, even if at times it embodies all of them. Writing, original writing, is created from thoughts. Thoughts are personal to the writer. Thoughts come first. Everything else is window dressing. Just as speech required a context for risk and communication with an active partner, so too writing requires a witness and compassionate reader. Writing thrives when it becomes a dialogue between the author and his or her audience, particularly the audience of an invested parent. Scripting that dialogue is not possible. A set of workbook pages doesn't get at the mind life of the child. Writing forms can't instruct the process of self-inquiry, which is the genesis of all good writing. Handing our children a set of instructions to be read alone and a book with lines on the page to fill in doesn't help them imagine themselves as writers. Rather, they are being taught that writing is external to self, done for that page according to someone else's ideas of what should go there. Literally, open and go workbook writing programs ask children to think of writing as a task done according to someone else's prescription of what goes over there away from self. Children are taught to think that the thoughts for writing exist inside someone else's vision and their job is to hunt them down, pluck them from the thin air, and hope they've collected enough of them in one place to get a good grade. This is not writing. This is puzzle solving, holding the directions in the mind while wrestling language into the imagined form the assignment creator may have intended. Yet this assignment writing in a workbook is the holy grail of writing instruction. Can't parents hand a book to their children and ask them to follow the clear instructions? Won't writing grow from this practice? What about all those writing assignments in high school and college? Kids don't get to pick their topics or formats then, do they? Why not practice now? Parents, typically, don't have good memories of writing instruction from their childhoods, and many are not self-confident writers today. Yet many programs expect parents to instruct children in writing using similar methods that didn't work all that well for them. These programs lead to similar results. Mediocre, unconfident writing. That's not to say that some kids don't find their way to brilliance and enthusiasm. Writers, kids who love writing, find their way regardless of method half the time. Helpful writing requ instruction requires a philosophy that is a paradigm shift away from how you, the parent, likely learn to write. The shift is in focus away from form and accuracy as primary, and toward risk and expression as essential. Original writing is about how the mind generates thought. Instruction is about how you foster an environment for creative thinking and use of language to grow. It's about recognizing that writing is more than words on a page, but is, rather, the valuing of the writer's own perspective of the world a writer's personal experiences and values, curiosities, mastery of facts, passionate reads, hopes and aspirations, confusions and frustrations, challenges and arguments, connection to others and reporting of information. This is writing. 
All writing is this, this distillation of an individual's mind life, thought world. Clarity and accuracy matter, but so do inspiration, imagination, critical thinking, and flexible expanded vocabulary. Form helps to manage these aspects of the topic for writing, but forms can also stifle original thought. Knowing how to write means knowing how to manage the forms rather than being managed by them. All this to say, open and go deprives writing of its essential context, space and room to explore. Can you imagine asking for an open and go parenting manual? Open and go driver's training? Open and go sexuality and reproduction workbook? When we are dealing with danger, complexity, values, intimate relationships, connection, or thought lives, we do our children a disservice to think we can teach them by opting out of the hard work of engaging with them. True partnership and dialogue go more slowly, but so much more richly. Brave Writer has materials and classes that support the relationship of new writer to parent coach. We even give you specific words to say and processes and practices to try together. These are tools that can be used again and again as your young writers learn to internalize the self-inquiry style of writing generation. We give you projects to test together with week-by-week -week instructions of what to do. But in each case, all the way until high school, your presence, your appreciation for, and understanding of the process your conversation and modeling, that's all essential. Make time and space for writing in your family. It can look like tea time and poetry on some days. It can look like family movie night or read aloud time or free writing or riddle creating or limerick reciting. It may be the hard work of jotting down an endless story or the wise support you offer a team trying to start a blog about recycling. Writing instruction might include the hard work of grammar study or learning to edit for spelling errors. But it isn't essentially that. It is the discovery of what one has to say that is worth preserving and presenting in a cogent manner. Writing is unlike any other subject in homeschool. In fact, it's not a subject. Writing is about writers. Writers need readers. You are the reader, the partner, coach, and ally your child deserves as you help your writers discover their voices their vocabularies, and their powers of refining their messages in the written word. No open and go workbook can show you how to do that. You need to live it alongside your kids once you've adopted the principles into your heart. It's a privilege to be that person in your child's life. Don't delegate it to a workbook. Yes, it takes time. So do all the things you care most about. Surprisingly, Teaching writing that way is so pleasurable. It doesn't feel like work anymore. It feels like relationship, a good, rich one. The kind you want with your kids. The kind that lets you into their hearts and minds. So worth it. Quote of the day. Boy, did I need to hear this. As a mom with three kids and two of which have special needs, we spend much of our time on the go. And I was thinking, we need the perfect workbook. This article calmed me, thank you. Jen Fisher Midkiff. Sustaining thought. What a privilege it is to be the one that encourages your children to open their minds and hearts in writing and then to share it. Okay, so that was a long one. And I love talking about open and go. You know, if you read through the products in the Brave Writer catalog, you might notice that our Jot It Down program which is 10 writing projects for your youngest kids between five and eight, uses the language of open and go in this description. But here's the difference between that and what I'm talking about here. I wanted you to have some tools that for a parent, you can open, read the information, and immediately start working on a writing product. That's what Jot It Down Partnership Writing and Faltering Ownership are. They are not, however, open and go workbooks you hand a child and ask them to execute without your involvement. In fact, every product in Brave Writer includes the dynamic between parent and child. You can't escape it. I had somebody at a conference once say to me, 
I just want something I can hand my teenager for high school. I don't want to have to be involved. Well, interestingly, we have a high school writing book called Help for High School that is written to your teen with the point of view that your teen could read it and do the work. But you know what I told that parent and what I still tell parents? I still hope you're reading your child's writing. I still hope you're interested in what they're producing. I still hope that you're having the big juicy conversations that enable your child to develop the rich insight that they will put into that essay. So even though the product relieves you of the burden of creating the words around writing, of knowing what to do and how to do it, I still expect your involvement. Because until your children are living independently of your home, you are their best reader. You're the most important partner they will have in the development of the writing life. And I want you to ensure that that is actually happening for your kids. The only way we know that that is happening is if you take the deliberate act of involving yourself. Now that involvement can vary. It can be your child's in the public school and they bring home an assignment and you read it for typos. It could be that you type the first draft to save your child of the additional stress after having handwritten a first draft. It could be that you simply are the dialogue partner. But no matter what kind of writing your child does at any stage, you are perfectly positioned to be the person that gives them the best kind of feedback they need for growth. And that's why I have a problem with quote unquote open and go writing workbook programs. You know, there's one famous one that I think the first uh, exercise is something like learning to write a complex sentence. And it starts with writing about an object like, I have a pencil. And then you add adjectives like, I have a yellow pencil. I have a big yellow pencil. I have a big yellow pointy pencil like that. But that is not teaching writing. Writing comes from speech. It comes from a self. It comes from your ability to express. So rather than starting with this weird structure where you're sort of imposing on children this idea that writing is not comfortable and it doesn't come from that originary place of language that lives inside of them, what you're doing is you're actually stripping them of the very skills they already innately possess. Any child who can get words out in a meaningful conversation is a writer already. And what we're doing is we're capturing those words. And then we were helping them discover how to enhance, expand, and enrich that content for a written context. And this is why reading aloud and reading to self are so important. Kids who learn to speak by listening to speakers also learn the cadence of writing by reading writers. And it's important that they read across the board. They shouldn't only read high quality literature. It's okay to read blogs, text messages, billboards, slogans on the backs of cars, because written communication is all of those. And it is slowly shaping the inner ear, helping kids imagine, well, if I'm writing something that's sort of markety, I should listen to advertising jingles. If I'm writing something that's persuasive, I should go read the reviews on Amazon and Rotten Tomatoes. If I'm writing something that is personal and revealing, I need to read diaries and memoirs. If I'm writing something that is supposed to sound historical, I should read from the era that I want to reproduce in my own writing. If I'm writing poetry, I should read poets. Because the inner ear is part of what you are cultivating the same way the outer ear cultivated a child's ability to speak. Morgan says that her kids read the back of cereal boxes. Absolutely. The cereal companies know that. That's why they make them interesting. That's why they put so much copy back there because they know everyone's sitting at the table and what's right in front of them? The box. They can market. They can talk about the high quality of the food within. They know that's prime real estate for reading. And that's true about anything you read, whether it's on a phone, in a video game, up on a billboard, the text message from your best friend. 
These are all ways we engage and communicate. Now, occasionally, I get comments from parents who say, texting is ruining the writing abilities of my child. They never have to spell anything correctly. They've stopped using punctuation. Nobody uses capital letters. Here's what I say to teenagers when we are moving into expository writing, for example. I uh, have taught advanced composition, the essay classes, SAT, all of those to our high school students in Brave Writer. And here's what I say at the beginning of class. You guys are polyglots of the digital age. You know many more Englishes than I do. You know how to text in a kind of English I don't even use very well. You know how to post on a discussion board to have the maximum impact using emojis and emoticons and different structures of language and you've eschewed punctuation because it gets in your way. But you also know because you are readers and because you've been raised how to write through copywork and dictation, you know how to use standard written English. So here's the deal we always strike. You can ask me questions using any digital form of English you know because this is an online context. So if you want to drop capitals and use shortcut spellings, I don't care. When you are writing the essay and submitting a draft to me, however, I expect you to be the polyglot that you are and use your other English, written English, to the best of your ability. And we all make mistakes even then. But I know you're fluent in multiple Englishes and I expect you to be able to determine which context requires which skill set. If we approach it this way, we stop creating an enemy experience around the modern context. The digital age creates a completely different set of expectations around language. I learned, for example, from my kids that when I text them and I end with a period, they always think I'm taking a tone of voice with them that is a little bit insistent and unfriendly. To me, I'm just adding a period because my whole life periods come at the end of a sentence. But it was astonishing to hear them describe that experience for them. And in fact, what it would do is they would come back with some kind of defensive comment and I couldn't figure out where that was coming from. The period became tone of voice in texting in a way I had never experienced it. Now I leave the period off. Suddenly when I get a text that has a period, it feels a little hostile. Isn't that amazing? And yet I can still use periods when I'm writing a blog post or when I'm creating a product like the one that you are holding in your hand. Instead of fighting those contexts, can't we embrace them and understand the functionality for each individual one? So when we're talking about open and go curricula then, what we're really talking about is the desire to get out of the job of being a home educator. But didn't you sign up to be one? And I know when you've got a parcel of kids and multiple subjects and levels, you're looking for the easy path, at least in some subject. So can I at least make my case that if you want something open and go, you do something like, you know, um, the grammar roots, you know, uh, what's that one called? My brain just blinked. The Latin roots program or, you know, drilling math facts or red herrings. Pick something that benefits from just sitting down and clicking through explode the code. But when we're talking about original writing, promise me that your chief goal isn't to hand that responsibility off to your child and to lose the privilege of your involvement. The best writing your kids will do comes from a dialogue with you. Just like their best speak, speech comes from dialogue with you. You know, they've done um, studies on these kids. Rummy Roots, thank you, Karina, that was it. <laughs> um, they've done studies on kids who've been raised in orphanages. Uh, there was a syndrome that was well known in Romania when there were just huge numbers of children without parents being raised on their backs, on their stomachs, fed on a schedule uh, in these orphanages as babies. And the lack of conversation with those children stunted their ability to connect humanly, emotionally to other people, to bond, and it stifled the growth and development of their speaking vocabularies. Think about that. Now, we all know that. We all know that. 
And yet, if you want to think about it, those orphanages were sort of the open and go orphanage, right? You put the baby in there, you put it on a schedule, you give it what it needs, and then you hope it will develop. Imagine then that that's what you're doing when you try to hand over the writing task to a child without a partner. You are saying, you can be in this room, in this crib, and this is all you need. It's like a bottle of formula propped up, no parent. Just drink it and grow. But what's missing? The connection, the feedback, the communication, the sense of relationship that helps writing blossom. And that is what we're all about in Brave Writer. So some of my products feel like they require something of you, like reading and thinking a little bit and internalizing the principles. Yeah, that's by design. I want you to take time, slow down. As we like to say in Brave Writer, go slow to go fast. It's okay to read a whole chapter of the writer's jungle and ruminate on it for two weeks before you actually do the activity. Because then when you come to the activity, the depth you will bring will be so much greater than if you whipped through, skimmed the first couple pages and just read the assignment and tried to do it on the spot. Wouldn't you rather have a satisfying feeling of accomplishment rather than just checking off the box? And if we believe, like we all say we do, that writing is essential to careers, to college, to grad school, then doesn't it deserve a good investment of our energy? Isn't it the most important subject we're teaching? I think so. And I'm not just saying that because I run a writing company. I believe in it. I believe in the power of the written word. It is the bedrock of civilization. Without the written word, we don't even have historical memory. Last year in February, I went to Peru to visit my daughter who was living there at the time. Noah, my oldest, and my daughter, Johanna, and I went to Machu Picchu, the Incan ruins, which was, you know, one of those once-in-a-lifetime experiences. And we were told by the guides who were there that the Incans had no written language. Everything they did was oral. They had a few pictures, but not even really a pictogram system. Everything had to be transmitted orally. And you know what? We don't know what their civilization was like. It's hard for us to know. We have to make educated guesses because nothing was written down. Imagine that. How long could a, a civilization sustain itself without writing? Eventually they were conquered. I think if we actually see the value of writing, its role in history. You know, there's that great book, um, How the Irish Saved Civilization. The monks were copying by hand the great works of literature during the period of time when the Roman Empire was being overrun, you know, by the Goths, by the, the, the Hun, by all of the Vandals. Thank God somebody wrote it all down and preserved that continuity for us. That's how we still have Plato. So when you think about writing, it isn't just something to get through. It's not just a subject to pass. It's not just something we do so they can get a good score in the SAT. We are actually helping them become members in this exclusive community of preservers, right? People who contribute to the great conversation across the centuries. And writing is your privilege to foster with your children. It isn't just something to do. It's not just about accuracy, you know? I mean, I've already found typos in this book while I'm reading it aloud. And yet people keep telling me they love this book. How is it possible they love it when I'm finding a typo? Well, because the content and the accuracy of the punctuation are not the same thing. Accuracy in punctuation is valuable insofar as it helps the reader hear the way it was written in the voice of the writer. And it gives them meaningful places to stop and pause and hook the eye and to know how it sounded to the reader. But if there's a mistake, does that really rob us of the meaning and the content? 
So I think we've put far too much emphasis on grammar, accuracy, spelling, punctuation, and not nearly enough on the magic of content. The curious nature of an internal person showing up on paper and how we can give feedback and dialogue that enriches and enhances that and that allows that writing to enrich and enhance us. I did a descriptive paragraph with my two oldest kids one time back in, you know, California years and years and years ago. And we pulled out the items they were describing. And the item Johanna chose was my guitar. And I think I included her description in the writer's jungle. But one of the ways that she described the look of it was the color of a melon of a cantaloupe because my guitar had this sort of peachy brown look to it. And I remember being moved. I thought I never saw that until she showed it to me. I never saw it until she showed it to me. What a privilege to live inside Johanna's head for a moment, externalized onto paper, allowing me to experience my guitar through new eyes and new language, through a metaphor that was powerful. Don't you want that? Don't you? Too many writing programs give you the sample paragraph that you read, and then you're like, I can't even remember what was in that paragraph. You know, we focus on the topic sentence, like that's the be all end all of paragraph writing. I had a great experience years ago. This was also in California. I was a part of a five person co-op, right? So there were five families and my girlfriends and I, the other four and me would meet at Mimi's cafe every other week. We did it on Saturday mornings. Our husbands looked after our children and we met there with our book. You know, I think we read the Charlotte Mason companion one time. We read some other book, Konos, whatever it was. And each week we would discuss what was in this book. And it was our time to grow as home educators. And I remember we got to this one chapter where we were talking about writing. And so I set them a task. This is long before Brave Writer was even a thing, but they knew I was a professional writer. And so I felt comfortable saying, hey, let's do this. So I said, let's pick an event this week and let's free write about it. Each of us as adults will do our own free write. We'll bring it back next week and then we'll talk about what it felt like to free write and what we felt about our own writing. So everyone did it. You know, we weren't teaching our kids. We were learning for ourselves. This is how we grew. We come back to Mimi's and my one friend, Eileen, pulls out her free write and it's about her visit to Farmer's Market. And she starts reading and she suddenly catches herself. Uh, let me just tell you, this is from the best of my memory. I don't have it here in front of me, but it started something like this. You know, the pungent fishy smell confronted me as I walked under a series of umbrellas. I passed fresh spinach. I heard a melody being played on a flute. I wandered by ripe tomatoes. And she says all of this and we're immediately drawn in. I'm like, where is she? I wonder where she is. And then all of a sudden she stops reading and she goes, oh wait, I forgot the topic sentence. And she goes back to the beginning and just says these words in front of what she had just written. Last week, I went to the farmer's market down the street from my house. And then she launches into the pungent fishy smell and we all started laughing. And I said, Eileen, you just ruined your writing. We don't need that topic sentence. Right now, we are curious. We want to know where you are. I'm going to keep listening till I figure it out. The moment you added, last week, I went to the farmer's market near my house. I was done. I'm like, well, I've been to farmer's markets. I know what those are like. Why do I need to keep reading? Why would I care about her take on it? I already have been. Suddenly, I'm supplying all my own images, all my own experiences, all my own memories. And I literally check out when she starts giving me her three points. The topic sentence is the most overrated piece of writing instruction on the planet. What we want to do is woo the reader, draw them in, save the punchline for the end of the paragraph. Sometimes when you're in a journalism school, they teach you this. Somebody I noticed just wrote dynamic lead is better than a topic sentence. Yes. In fact, they will tell you in journalism school, bury the lead, hide it, help me 
be drawn into the writing before I find out what I'm reading about. Because otherwise, what do I do? I say, oh, well, I already know what a farmer's market is. Or, well, I already know who I want to vote for. Or, I already know all movies starring Tom Hanks make me feel this way. We supply the information when we already know what it's about. What we want instead is for our kids to start to tap into their natural playfulness with the reader. Their natural, I'm in control of this universe and I'm wooing you in, hand over hand. So my friend Eileen, we all voted. Take that dang topic sentence out of your beautiful free write. And then she read it and by the end, we were so touched. We loved it. And then the next person went and we had this experience as a five sub. And I recommend it to you. The best writing help you can give to your kids is for you to practice writing in the context of people who read it. Why wouldn't you do that once every few weeks? Why wouldn't you read your writing to your friends and experience the same panic and terror your kids feel when they have to read theirs to you? This is exactly why thinking a workbook could teach writing is so ineffective. And it's why in Brave Writer, even the products that we say are easy for you to use and implement still require that parental involvement. I don't know about you, but when I signed up to home educate, my goal wasn't to be curriculum coordinator or educational advisor. I actually wanted to do this thing. I thought it would be cool if I taught my kids to read, if I was their partner in the writing life, if we discovered the value of numbers together. That's why I took on this job. I wasn't looking to sit from a desk and send them to tutoring classes and do nothing. Otherwise, put them in school. I remember, and that's a fine choice. If that's where you are, do it. Um, I remember I had a friend, she had a couple of kids in high school, and high school is the time when you really ramp up all these other outlets, right? Like you want them to do sports with select soccer and then they take piano lessons somewhere and then you hear about this great biology dissection that the father of one of your kid's best friends is teaching on Sunday night or Tuesday nights. And then you also have, you know, this wonderful writing co-op and then this art teacher and pretty soon you've got six or eight or 10 or 12 things going that require you to drive them somewhere. And I remember my friend said to me, she goes, my gosh, we just live in the car. We're like car schoolers now. We just go from here to here to here. She goes, I was thinking, Julie, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a building where all of these people who offer these different skills could meet and they could offer them all in the same building, kind of back to back, and that we wouldn't have to drive so many places. And I laughed. I said, wait, you're serious. She goes, yeah, don't you think that'd be cool? I said, you know what they call that? They call that school. We already have those. That's what the school system is. It's a place where experts come together and sequence the subject so the kids can all go to one place and get everything they need in one day. And she, her eyes popped open and we both just started laughing. And she said, oh my gosh, that's what I'm doing, isn't it? I said, yeah, you've recreated school, but you've just made it 10 times harder for yourself. Now, whether or not she should change, totally up to her. Maybe all the teachers of these five, eight, 10 things she's doing are better than what she could get in the school system. But there isn't a more ideal model than school. School is designed to make it easy for you. That's the most open and go program available. You are not the educator. Someone else is. And all you have to do is get them on the bus with a, with a lunch every day and sign a few permission slips. But you chose to homeschool. And if you aren't farming out all these subjects, it's on you to be that dialogue partner, to be that instructor, to be the person who creates meaning for your child in this subject area. And Brave Writer is here to be your best friend, <laughs> to make that possible so that you aren't alone. You can triangle in one of our online classes where the instructor will talk with you. You can buy one of our products and read a product written to a homeschooling parent in the experience you're living. You can consult with us. You can join the Alliance. You can watch these broadcasts on Facebook Live. 
That's all I'm about. I'm about empowering a parent to do the job you signed up for when you said you wanted to be a homeschooler. So beware of open and go. Enjoy that job. Go slow to go fast. Invest deeply. And be all about your kids becoming wonderful writers. We're with you on this program. Okay, invest deeply. Write bravely and live honestly. <laughs> I went backwards today. <laughs> Love y'all. Have a great day and I will see you in the Alliance tomorrow or a week from now on Facebook Live.